I want to I want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, thank you so much for making time in your schedule to be a part of conversations that I believe are moving the needle um, to creating a more equitable workspace for for people, uh, for all people. Um, what what do we do now is an honest conversation about equity in the workspace, uh, getting business leaders together to, to open up about what they are experiencing, what they see and what they're doing to make a difference. The journey has, uh, we have categorized this journey into the awakening, the awareness, um, active and advocate. And this is the journey, equitable journey from where you start and when you realize that there's something different in the way people treat other people, all the way to stage four where you're an advocate and uh, you are a champion um, in the workspace as well as uh, moving the needle for, ev for everyone. Um, today, we are gonna focus on active. And active, the definition is actively implementing strategies to promote equity in the workplace and in your personal life. One of my, one of my favorite quotes uh, from diversity advocate Vernon Myers is, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. which leads us to the question that everybody is asking right now. What do we do now? Um, and this is important because as the new cycles begin to cycle through um, and move uh, into the election and into other things that are happening in America and around our world, we have got to continually be asking the question, what do we do now to, can, to keep these conversations going, to challenge people and to help people have a structure and a framework to create a more equitable environment, not just for people who look like them, but for everybody. I'd like to welcome uh, my panelists today. Uh, I'm so excited um, to, to, have these, to have these gentlemen together to chat um, and, and, ha and have a conversation that, that I hope challenges you, that um, inspires you, and, and possibly opens your eyes to help you move the needle inside of your organization. I wanna welcome Brett Hurt, a CEO of Data World, Brandon Allen, co-founder at TXV Partners, Marcus Stroud, co-founder at TXV Partners. Um, guys, thank you so much for, for making time in your schedule. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to, to, to share this space with you and to, and to chat and hopefully inspire some people today. So, so here's my question is, tell me and tell all of us from your view, what is the landscape of tech and venture capital? All of you are in, uh, have some connection to, to tech and um, startups. Um, raising money, funding, uh, starting companies. Um, what, what is the landscape when it comes to equity inside of those environments? Um, Brandon, can we, can we start with you? Give me, give, give me your thoughts. Hey, Brandon, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, I can be pretty direct here. It, it's, it's abysmal, right? It's um, just one of the most homogenous uh, industry sectors of the economy uh, relative to almost anything else. I think of, you know, as you know, Marcus and I run a venture capital firm. Fewer than 1% of, you know, GPs at venture capital firms are black or Latino combined. Um, that, to me, is just a clear, glaring example of inequality. Um, the lack of creation of access. Uh, I don't think it's unique to venture capital. I think we can say that across the asset management industry, writ large, we've been on a 30 year experiment to increase diversity, which has failed. Um, because relative to 30 years ago, the, the statistics really haven't changed that much. Um, and I think that just staring at those facts, that that's really where we have to begin and end when we discuss where the tech sector is. There are definitely positive movements, don't get me wrong. I think in the, especially in the last four years, we've really seen an outpouring of 
of consciousness, especially with uh, the recent murder of George Floyd. Um, but, you know, to the topic of this conversation, we need to figure out how to translate some of that rhetoric into action, uh, concrete action that's actually going to affect how people live their lives and the type of access that they receive. Brett, um, from, your, from your vantage point, is there an actual real movement towards equity um, outside of yourself um, in your circles? I, th I think so. I mean, you know, we, we have to start with the fact that we do have a systemic racism problem in this country. And it started with the original sin of slavery and the creation of this concept of whiteness, which was literally a fabrication um, to tie together people that had a certain pigment of skin color, even though they came from all different types of countries. And this, uh, this systemic problem has led to a lot of huge issues. I mean, it's led to the, the most shocking thing that I've learned after George Floyd and, and so many other, you know, deaths, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, murders really, um, is that, you know, that the median black family in the United States has $17,000 of wealth and the median white family has $170,000 of wealth. That's a 10x difference. There's no way you explain that away. But having said that, here's why there's some silver linings. There are more VC capital firms now founded by women, led by women, focused on investing in women. And there are starting to become quite a few venture capital firms led by um, Black people, Black American citizens that are focused on um, funding other, you know, Black American entrepreneurs. And it, we have a long, long way to go, a long way to go, but there's reasons for hope in that. And I think that, you know, one of the ways I look at things in being Jewish is would I want to go back, you know, 50 years, 100 years and live in that time? And the answer for me is no, <laughs> right? And, you know, my Jewishness is not apparent. You know, I don't have a different, you know, skin color or something, you know, like that. It's so silly that, that that's even, you know, a basis of judgment in this country, but it is. And it's because of this problem of systemic racism and that original sin um, but, you know, this is the, this is the best time in America in some ways for Jewish people. And I think that this is the best time in America in some ways for female entrepreneurs, for people of color that are entrepreneurs. And I don't think any of us would snap our fingers and want to go back 50 years. Doesn't mean there's not a tremendous gap and a lot to do, but we have to look at it from that context of, there's a beginning of green shoots and, and hope. And, um, and, you know, the other types of systemic issues that we have to address is that at least in tech, which is the world I'm in, um, we have more, you know, kind of people of color graduating from engineering, et cetera, than we had before, but there's a huge gap there. So the type of people that start tech companies We've got to focus on the basis of education. One of the things I learned recently from a talk by Ray Dalio, this is an interview from Ted, and I did a distillation on my blog. My blog is lucky7.io. Um, he's the co-founder of Bridgewater Capital and um, you know, very, very successful. And he said that people that have over $100,000 of income they spend more than six times the amount educating their children, more than six times the amount of educating their children than people that, that are you know, lower, much lower income. That's a, that's a huge gap. I mean, that's a huge, huge, huge problem. And so we've got to focus on things at the root of where the problem kind of manifests. Um, and, you know, hit it both ways, hit it from the top, like from the VCs and entrepreneurs and hit it from the bottom as well to create more people of color that are entrepreneurs that have access to the types of education that 
for example, my children do. Marcus, when, you, when you're looking at the landscape and um, of course there are some bright spots and there's, and there's, a, there's, there's some places that need a lot of change. What do you think people can actively do today to highlight to highlight that hope and to and to bring fire to it? What do I think people can do today to highlight that hope and bring fire uh, when looking at, I guess, areas for change? I think it's things like this, you know, panels number one, and and having very influential people in that panel or like a part of the discussion, not just on the panel, but like listening into the discussion. I think the more people you bring into the conversation, the the more change you can create. So this is my philosophy. I think Brandon and I look at the world, and I'm just speaking for Brandon. Uh, it's my boy, and we've been we've been doing this in about eight ten years. Um, we look at the world kind of what Brett just said. Like, yes, there is a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of you know things that folks of color, you know, female entrepreneurs, a lot of people have to overcome. But at the same time, there's no better time to be a, you know, African-American trying to do something because it's, it, there's a lens towards that. And I think for me, I grew up in a very small town outside Dallas. My family's originally from a real country town in Louisiana. And, you know, I grew up around majority white people my whole life. Then I got to Princeton, probably the whitest Ivy League school out of the entire Ivy League, which is saying something. And, you know, the ignorances were always the same. Didn't matter if you were deep in the middle of the South or you were, you know, up here in Hosh Posh, New England. I think a lot of people don't know what they don't know. And so, you know, what I learned was instead of me, you know, beating somebody over the head with something or saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you don't get it, you guys are, you know, whatever, you know, bring people into the conversation and just having a coffee or just having one-on-ones or just like, you know, creating discussions like this, it moved mountains. Because I had friends and, and colleagues who, you know, they're like, hey, I never had this, you know, experience. I never, nobody really pointed out to me because for a lot of people, um, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of time, Brandon and I are the first black people that have ever been in their house, you know? Some of our LPs, we're the first black people they've ever met, you know, or, or been in their house for dinner. Uh, you know, for, some, for a lot of our friends in college, we were the first black friends of theirs, you know? And so I think for us, uh, you know, we, we take it as a privilege that we can open the conversation to people of all backgrounds, and therefore the more conversation we, can, we have, the more we can highlight together yeah. instead of like, you know, cause I feel like attacking people or attacking things sometimes isn't going to work. And so, and, and to clarify when I said me and Brandon have been doing this thing for 10 years, we haven't been in BC together for 10 years. We've literally been best friends since we were freshmen in college, almost 10 years. And so that's what I, that's what I meant by that. And, and so uh, earlier you, you alluded to being, um, being the only black person you, you, you guys in sometimes in people's houses are, are making these relationships. Um, I have, there's two folds of that. Have you felt like you've had to, are, have you felt like you've been able to bring your whole self to relation to certain relationships? And do you feel like there's an openness to, to people actually um, getting to know you and getting, and getting to know all of you? So, yeah, I'm gonna keep it real. Uh, I think early on you, you kind of, you have that, that, that white lens is what I call it, where, you know, you're trying to get comfortable, you're trying to get to know people. And then it got to the point where I was like, no, I don't care. Quite frankly, I'm going to bring my whole self to you. Um, and what I've learned is the more real we are with people, the more real we are with our friends, the more real we are with investors, the more comfortable they become because they're not, you know, they're not used to that, but they're like, but like they're so shielded from so much, that like when two guys are willing to actually keep it real with you and, and call you out on certain things and just be our just completely real self, it's it's comforting for a lot of people. Now sometimes it makes these people be a little too comfortable with us, but <laughs> but at the same time, but at the same time, that's how you create equality in my opinion, is that you just kind of help create comfort in the room that you can have honest discussions, you can be vulnerable with each other. And you know, Brandon can give you example after example of, you know the amount of folks from different backgrounds that have said to us, you know, I just enjoyed having that conversation with you. Like, you know, Brandon's yeah. house, people will go to his house hours and hours and sit there and just talk to him on his balcony because they just love having these open discussions. And so that, that, that's kind of what I feel. Brett, when you are 
when you are connecting with other CEOs and, and other people um, inside of your circle who may not be people of color, are you having these conversations and what do these conversations look like? Yeah, we are, but, but I'm intentionally creating that space. So, I mean, on the previous question, I believe it's imperative that you bring your whole self into work. It's going to make the company a lot more fun. Sometimes it's going to lead to uncomfortable conversations. But, um, you know, you may remember in prep that I asked, is it okay to talk about politics? And look, it took this moment to have, uh, you know, half African-American, half Indian woman um, named as the VP candidate on the Biden, you know, Harris ticket. And I think that's a great, great thing. I and mean, that's a sign of progress. And, um, and I really, really, really hope that they win. I think this is a very, very important moment in, in, the, in the country's history where we have to restore decency and we have to restore respect for each other and we have to restore empathy and connection and bridging the polarization that's happening in this country. I've never seen it more polarized and that's really you know, kind of upsetting and depressing uh, because we're all Americans, you know, we're all immigrants. I mean, you know, in, unless, unless you are a Native American, we are all immigrants in this country. And we've all had, you know, lots of advantages for that. Now, definitely this country was set up to benefit white males. And the, like I said, the concept of whiteness was an invented concept. It was invented for power. And it was invented to have this kind of systemic advantage. And that's wrong. And we need to right the ship on that and really live up to our ideals, as MLK said, and what we actually wrote down <laughs> in the documents, you know, like actually live those documents. And so I've created the spaces to answer your question. I've created spaces where other CEOs have come together where we talk very openly about how do we create more diverse environments, more inclusive environments in our companies. And, um, and we've made a lot of progress on that. I mean, a lot of progress on that and, you know, put together playbooks and helped other startups and that kind of ripples out. You know, we started our company as a B corporation. We actually get measured on diversity publicly, there's a public score for data.world as it compares us to other companies. We look at it, we look at it as a board of directors, it changes the dialogue. A B Corporation is a company that's set up with a public benefit mission at its core. And you report on it publicly every year to your shareholders, but I decided to report on it to everybody. You can read about it at data.world. Um, if you just go to slash about, and you'll see a tab where you can just look at how we became a B Corporation. You can see what we've done as a B Corporation. We're proud to report on that publicly and live up to a very public level of scrutiny there. Um, I've also, you know, gotten involved with um, the Henry Crown Fellowship. I'm a Henry Crown Fellow out of the Aspen Institute, where we've really studied these, uh, th these issues in depth. One of the most amazing speeches, which I had never heard of um, growing up, was that we studied was Frederick Douglass's speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. That's someone who brought their whole person in. <laughs> he, brought the, he brought his whole person in in front of a, you know, pretty much all white crowd, you know, a few decades before the Civil War. And um, you can actually say that that speech actually helped lead to the Civil War and in him bringing his whole person in very bravely. I mean, I can't even imagine how brave you'd have to be to give a speech like that at the age of 35 when you're self-educated and you've been born into a system where you literally were born into slavery and became freed from that and then educated yourself to be able to deliver such a powerful speech and lead like that and lead a nation like that. Um, so I've had to really seek out things. One of the things that I would really encourage everybody on here to attend, and it's something that Mayor Adler has endorsed and said that if every citizen in Austin took this, we'd have a much better community, a much more diverse and inclusive community, 
is courageous conversations beyond diversity. I took that its two day course. I took it last year. Now everybody at data.world, all 70 of our people are cascading through it. And we're, are, you know, we're gonna have everybody in the company take it and then everybody in the company that ever joins going forward, take it. Um, it's an amazing, I mean, it's an amazing wake up call to what these issues are. And it's very uncomfortable to sit in that space as a white man. It's very uncomfortable to know that, you know, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't choose to be born into this country. I was born into this country. I love this country. Um, I like to believe that um, my wife and I, you know, really made it together. We got married. I had a thousand dollars. She had two thousand dollars. We had three thousand dollars of wealth, and our parents didn't give us anything, um, you know, to help start us out as entrepreneurs. And you know, we we turned into pretty prominent entrepreneurs and investors. We're in eighty nine startups and twenty seven VC funds as investors through our family office. But let's be honest, I had huge, huge advantages because of my skin color, because of the fact I was male, I am male. And, um, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's hard to reconcile with, with that American kind of pull yourselves up by your bootstrap story and, you know, like you made it as an entrepreneur. And there's truth in that too. I mean, there was struggle in there and I did have things to overcome and had to find product market fit and all these things that Brandon and Marcus look for, you know, great product market fit, great repeatable go to market fit, you know, all of those things are hard to find, but I had huge, huge advantages that I was frankly blind to, literally blind to, because I was born into a racist country. It was set up on a racist ideal, but I didn't know, you know, and, and I, and I saw racism, as a child, I don't mean to say that I never saw racism. Of course I did. I saw skinheads down on 6th Street one time beating up a um, you know, black, black man. I don't know if he even lived. I mean, it was one of the scariest things I ever saw in my life. I saw it and ran and tried to find some police and there were no police in downtown Austin back then. It was a really scary time in downtown Austin. Um, and it was really, it was really, I'll never forget it. I had nightmares about that for a long time. It was racist. If that, if those skinheads had known I was Jewish, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been good for me. Um, you know, but yeah, it's, it's uh, bringing our whole person in and seeking out those environments where we really challenge ourselves to learn the truth. I mean, the truth is liberating. That's the thing. The truth is hurtful to, to learn sometimes. And in this case, it really is hard to learn. Um, but it's very liberating once you learn it, because then you can be a part of the change. You can say, okay, I now know that there's a real problem and I can be a part of the change. And one of the things that I look at with our platform at data.world is if we really focus well on hiring people of color, empowering people of color, including them, putting them in leadership positions, et cetera, last quarter, our number one performer was an African-American male in the company as voted by his peers. And, and, and if we, and we, you know, we hold him up as a standard bearer um, in living our values, then if data.world becomes as successful as Bizarre Voice, that's gonna empower a lot of people and they're gonna go off and do great things. The most amazing things about Bizarre Voice is there's now been 48 companies started by former Bizarre Voice people. Think about the jobs and the ripple effects that has and all the philanthropies impacted after that, after, you know, we took the company public at a billion dollar valuation. So wow. I'm, uh, I'm very motivated on this issue, but I'm also very educated on it. And, you know, I've chosen, you know, another space I chose to be involved in, which feels very uncomfortable, even being this educated on it, is I'm involved in this group called White Men for Racial Justice. And we meet every other Tuesday night for an hour and a half seven to eight thirty and we study um how systemic it is and we sit in that with each other and it's a, it's it's an all white male because it's uh th there's a lot of things we've studied that it actually is not fair when you bring a person of color into that space um 
that people of color need their own spaces to discuss the issue and discuss it very openly and not have you know white people there to be the explainers to them of the issue. So we've dived deep, but we have people of color that are helping inform our group, that are helping inform us what to read and the types of exercises to do. Um, but we do the hard work ourselves and that's a, that's a choice I'm making. And I think the more people that make that choice, the more equitable our society is gonna be because once you know the truth, it's very motivating to do something about it. Brandon, um, I'd like to go, go to you and um, tell me a little bit about how you guys have built the company, um, how you were investing and how you are taking your, how are you taking the DNA and, and, and seeing that that is perpetuated throughout your investments? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take you stepwise. How we started, um, you know, Marcus and I were, were given an opportunity, right, by someone who in this case did not see our race to really step into the, the Silicon Valley world and, and try and prove our chops live and up close. Um, from the, the first minute, I think, if, uh, you know, from five years old, I think every single black person is aware that they're black. Um, I mean, I remember seeing, you know, parents tell their children, and that they are black and, and that's something that's important to Marx and myself, right? And so that perspective, I think, influences everything we do. I don't, I don't know how I can disintegrate, um, you know, my, my faith as a religious person, my status as a black person, my chosen life as an entrepreneur from anything that I do. And so to, to concretize that, uh, Marx and I, you know, we made the commitment after the George Floyd series of events um, to make sure that we were concretely actually investing in African-American entrepreneurs. We said, hey, we are going to attempt to, and this is something like we can, we can defend the other side, right? But we actually moved on this because of what we saw. We said, let's you know, target a specific amount of our AUM that is gonna go to companies founded by African-Americans, Hispanics, and women, because this for us should be a floor that we should publicly announce uh, in our efforts through what we do to ameliorate the effects of what we call the various forms of social death, right? Uh, sexism, racism, uh, ableism, whatever it might be. Um, and so as, as black men, we, we come out of a tradition of resilience. Uh, I don't, you know, given all the, the things that black people have gone through in this country, um, we are an extremely resilient community. We look to those sources of our community, whether that be the church or you know, the people who have come before us, like Frederick Douglass, as Brett was mentioning, to, to serve as inspirations for us. Um, in terms of how being Black has affected how we run this company, I think it's, we take diversity really seriously. We take it really seriously. I don't think it's something that we can take out of any conversation that we have with an entrepreneur. It's not something that we can take out of any of our viewpoint when we're looking at companies. Mm -hmm. If we see um, you know, for example, I use the, the instance of wearables, right? There, there's a way in which wearables, fitness wearables can become coercive. Uh, they can say, that, okay, well, you're, you're going to have to wear this tracker, which is going to tell us how healthy you are before you get this job. Um, that's obviously going to disproportionately impact the people at the bottom. So if we saw that, you know, we'd, we'd have an issue with it because of, of who we are as black men. So... I'd, I'd like for I'd like for all you guys to everybody to answer this um, answer this this question. Um, I was on a panel not too long ago with some with some prominent VCs here in Texas, and one of the guys says, "You know, he'll invest in whatever company that comes that has the biggest return." Um, and he says that it's probably a waste of your money to look for companies with diverse representation. Um, and you should, you should invest in whatever's gonna make you the most money. Um, at the end of the day, is it, is it, is it your values or does it come down to profit? Brandon, can you start with it, with this yeah, one? I don't, I I don't know that we can separate the two, right? But I think the important thing is we actually understand the lens by which we're evaluating companies. An example that I like to give just because it, it's almost, 
in, in essence, the hardest is physics, right? And so in physics, there was a search for super string theory, um, the sort of grand unified theory of the universe for let's call it 50 years. And so the smartest people who graduated from the best schools would go on for this search that was ultimately futile. They, they haven't figured it out. And so we created this system that validated these people that were chasing this certain thing, but there was nobody who came from a different background that could be disagreeable enough to say that this search is worthless. So we construct these artifices, is, is the point I'm trying to make, of what we value and what we don't value, or what's gonna generate profit or what's not gonna generate profit. And so when I hear something like that, um, that's our mission as well. We're, we're trying to invest in the greatest return. But for us, that means that we actually need to understand that if African-Americans and Hispanics combined have $3.1 trillion of buying power and companies that don't have a diverse population aren't gonna be able to sell into them, um, that is the role in which TXE steps in to say, hey, we can build a bridge to these types of communities um, and, you know, within the African-American community, the Latino community to actually do that. When I, when I hear that, you know, whoever it was, I think we should just check <laughs> ourselves and try and understand uh, what we see as profitable and what we think of as not profitable, because I think it's clear through the lens of history that we've seen certain types of people, African-Americans, Hispanics, women, what have you, as less profitable and white males as more profitable. And that comes from, you know, sometimes it's conscious and sometimes it's implicit. And so I think we just need to just think a little hard. You know, Will, Will, do you mind if I jump in on this? Because I think it, I think that question actually connects to what Corey's asking here mm -hmm. that I'm pretty fired up to answer. Do um, make sure that we give uh, Marcus some time yeah, sure. to yep. get on this one as well. Yeah, so I mean, the, just, you know, a couple of things here. So one is this question Corey is asking, I'll just read what his question is. How are business leaders connecting with people outside of their own race, culture, et cetera, and not just hiring them to check a box for diversity, for diversity's sake? It connects to what you just asked and you know what, the, what that investor said. And I think it's a very false premise. Um, and it's something that we have to distinguish because it's basically saying that you, implicit in that is that you can't find people that are going to generate high returns that are diverse. And that's just not true at all. Now, what is true is you have to work harder. At it. That is true because we do have a systemic racism problem here. And so there are less numbers um, in certain fields of people that are diverse, that are leading those fields. But if you work hard at it and you find those people, you're gonna be great. And you're gonna, you're gonna help lift those people up and you're gonna be enablers to those people. And some people are gonna judge them based on the color of their skin, not even consciously, just subconsciously. And it could actually lead to much better returns because you are informed, you are educated, um, but you have to be explicit. One of the things that's just true about human beings is that I'm going to get invited to more Jewish events than you are because I'm Jewish. I've been to the Black Chamber of Commerce event in Austin one time because one of my friends was winning an award there. I'm not going to get invited to that very often. It's, it's just not something that people are going to naturally think to invite me to. But if I was, if my skin was black, then people would think to invite me more. The same thing with female events. You know, Ted has a women event. Um, it's, and, and another thing that's really going to help this issue is a lot of studies. It's been shown that if you have a board with females, you have a company that has females on the executive team, those companies significantly outperform. And so that, that, that way you can hit people in the head and the heart, but we've got to hit people in both. You've got to hit, hit people in the head and the heart. It's not just for the sake of checking a box. That is a horrible, horrible way to look at it. Um, it is always hiring the best period, but just being very explicit about 
focusing on the search to say, we're going to just focus on female candidates for this position, period. Don't tell me that female candidates aren't as qualified as male candidates, because that's just bullshit. And don't tell me that, um, you know, an African-American candidate is not as qualified. That's just bullshit. Like, we've got to, we've got to focus on, we've got to focus on it or it's not going to happen because if I don't focus on it at all, then I'm just going to hire more white males. And the reason why is because I'm invited to more white male events. And that's not, that's not, that's not saying anything negative. It's just the truth. You know, if you have a black uh, CEO, they're going to have more um, black American citizens in their company. It's just going to be a fact because they're in the social groups like the Chamber of Commerce events, the Black Chamber of Commerce events and other things where they're seeing those people. So how have we done it at data.org? We've been very explicit at showing up to those events, to showing up to the Hispanic Hackers events and other events where we are in those groups trying to make a difference and finding the people that are the most qualified, still absolutely focused on hiring the best, but showing up, being a part of it, being present. Marcus, I want to give you, I want to give you an opportunity yeah. to, to yeah. chat for him. Yeah, no, um, I got, oh, trust me, I got some, I got some to say, so. <laughs> okay. I had to take, I had to take my glasses off because I got hot hearing what you just said. Um, you know, that's the old, it's a problem I have with the VC industry and it's a problem I have with a lot of people in positions of power is they, they don't have the humility and the empathy to understand what they don't understand. And that's something that's plagued our country for a long time. You know, when you look at the MLB, when it was integrated, a lot of people were saying, we don't want black people in MLB. We just don't want it. it it's it's going to taint our game. We do not want this. The same thing was happening in the NFL. Then what happened? You have somebody like Jackie Robinson come along and the rest is history. Some of the greatest MLB players from Barry Bonds and Ken Griffey Jr. to Torrey Hunter to the Hispanics like Roberto Clemente, Sammy Sosa. You would never know about those people if you didn't give somebody an opportunity to come to the table. The same can be said for the NFL. You didn't want these people in the SEC. You didn't want these people. And then you got people like Jim Brown come along and he revolutionized the game for the running backs and whatever. And so it just pisses me off because nobody wants to give an opportunity to people uh, because they don't care to see what they don't you know, care to see. So then I'm going to flip it back on us. So if we had that same mentality as this Texas VC, that's like Brandon and I saying, guess what? Excuse me, I'm about, excuse me, I'm about to say, we don't want to hire anybody who didn't go to fucking Princeton. We don't want to hire anybody who didn't go to Harvard. We don't want to hire anybody who didn't go to Yale. Okay, we don't want to hire kids from Texas and Texas A&M and Baylor or TCU. Guess what? We don't want those people in our room. That would piss that person off because he's more than likely from one of those networks. You see, and then you don't know the talent you're missing out on when you only focus on one group of people. I look at a firm like Vista Equity, one of the top private equity funds in the world. They've had unbelievable returns. These people can raise $10, 15000000000 billion in a span of weeks. You know, they can do that easily because their returns speak volumes. But what I love about Robert Smith and, and, and Brian is those guys don't give a damn where you went to school. They care about what are you bringing to the table? How hard are you going to work? You know, you don't see Harvard, Princeton, Yale all up and down there. I mean, you got you see some of it, but you don't see it all up and down there, leadership chamber. You got people from all types of backgrounds. They make you take a blind test. And so you can't have that opinion unless you give somebody an opportunity. And so for me, like, I think moving forward, it's like, number one, America is just different than what it was 25, 30 years ago. You, you, either you get on board now, you, you get with the diversity train, or just get out the way. Because this country looks radically different than it did 25, 30 years ago, and you deal with it. If you don't like it, then guess what? You're going to get left behind because there's going to there's gonna be innovative entrepreneurs and great entrepreneurs that are going to say, unless I have an investor of color that's on my board or unless I can bring in these people, then I don't want your capital. So now you're going to miss out on some of the top entrepreneurs in the world because then if somebody like Mark Zuckerberg had said, I'm only going to take capital from firms that have a diversity focus in it, you're missing out on Facebook. And guess what? There's going to be a lot more Facebooks in the next 25, 30 years. So that's my response to that. Uh, and, and, and hey, well, like, if you have another panel, put me on the panel with that gentleman or that, that, that woman. I love, I love it. Uh, we, we, we can have some words. <laughs> and so I, and I'll end with this. I, when you, you asked a question earlier, how do we run our firm? Yeah. You know, I think playing football in my life has taught me a lot. I didn't play in the NFL like yourself. Uh, was a little too, a little too skinny, a little too not, not fast enough to get, get to 
play NFL linebacker. But um, what I learned playing at a place like Prosper in Princeton is that, you know, diversity and, 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 and freedom of thought is everything in a locker room. You know, you got people from all over the country. You got coaches from all over the country. And at the end of the day, everybody has the same goal, and that's to win. You, you're, you're not playing hard for the sake of sportsmanship. You don't give a damn that you had fun playing on Saturday. No, you care about winning. And that's the same thing that diverse entrepreneurs, they don't care that you put money in because they're black. They want you to know that they're going to return the capital. And so we run our firm with that same mentality. Is that like, hey, we, we're here to win. You know, yeah, we have a focus on diversity, but they, they, we're trying to kick your ass. We're trying to win. That, that's the mentality. We, we want to generate returns. And so sorry to get fired up. That just pissed me off, man. I, I, <laughs> you can ask Brandon. I get set off. I get set off like a, like a, like a freaking firework, man. <laughs> we it, that was funny when I uh, when I got to meet you and chat with you the first time it just it was just screaming sports coach um <laughs> oh, I want to see I'd be a head coach I'm telling you see this DC, guy with a whistle <laughs> <laughs> if I went to BC I'd be a head coach so you know one thing one thing I'd just say say about that will just real quickly yeah um it's 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 really an american imperative I mean, if you think about the things that we love the most about this country, it really is our diversity. I mean, you know, from the sights we see to the entertainment we experience to the foods we eat. I mean, you know, it's a very boring country where you go and there's no diversity and it's the same bland food all over the place. And there's no, you know, it's the same bland entertainment. And those, you know, we're the biggest exporter of entertainment and so many other things. And that, that's, so, so my point here is that it should be an American imperative to have a company that actually represents America. And it'll make your company a heck of a lot more fun if you have diversity and inclusion at the core. It'll make it a lot more American. And, and I'm talking about the best ideals of America. I'm not talking about the racist you know way that the country was set up i'm talking about the way it's evolved the things that we all love the most about it and you have that in your company if it actually represents america if it's representative of america you're going to think much more creatively you're going to perform much better you're going to have a heck of a lot more fun you know it's 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 going to be rich you know rich with uh with experience and and you know all types of perspective and and it's just so so important it's it's we need to reframe this as we're trying to make our companies more american than checking some box that's a ridiculous way to look at it so guys i um we're coming close to the end here, but I wanted to give everybody a little bit of time to, um, there are a lot of business leaders on this, on this call. Um, people who are in all, all sorts of different companies at, at different levels from startups all the way to larger, larger firms. And I would like for you guys to take a couple of minutes to, to give a couple of strategies that, um, that they can implement at their firm and also in, in their personal life that promotes equity. Marcus, why don't we, right, why, yeah. don't, why don't we start with you? What, yeah, what, yeah, are, yeah, yeah. what are the keys coach? Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a playbook <laughs> and everything. Yeah, Marcus is two it is. I'll give you a playbook. Um, you know, I think open conversation, open dialogue is first and foremost, giving your employees uh, room to speak, Room to, t room to talk and just, just being real with each other and then seeking people from the outside to look in and look at the holes. So, cause you know, a lot of people when you're inside a business, you're going to think everything is great. You, you're going to have rose colored glasses, but it takes people from the outside coming in and saying, Hey, this isn't right. You got to fix it. And so I think just making uh, progress towards that and ultimately having humility to understand that there are a lot of things I don't know. I think we live in a very kind of arrogant society and that like a lot of people don't care to acknowledge their wrongs. And I think, like I said, that just all comes with, I think one of the firms I want to highlight that actually is on this call is straight, straight capital, straight, you know, they're, they're a prominent fund administrator, prominent firm down in Dallas. They have probably the most diverse leadership I've seen out of any firm in that space, you know, and, and, and our experience with them has just been so unbelievable. And I think if companies kind of replicated some of the things that straight does, uh, 
you know, you would, you would have a more equitable workplace. And so I think, like I said, it all begins with dialogue, it all begins with conversation, and then just seeking influential help from the outside to come in and, 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 and do some of the things that Brett said. You know, it's like, Brett, I commend you for going to, you know, this, you know, this thing every other Tuesday with these white men. That is unbelievable. There needs to be more prominent, successful business leaders who are white men who do things like that. Because that's how you change the world. Because you guys are ultimately the gatekeeper for a lot of opportunities for young, diverse professionals like ourselves. So that's kind of, you know, what I think. Brett, I would like to, uh, like to go to you. Give me, give me, uh, give me the key. Give me the, the secret sauce. Um, of, well, uh, I, I've already mentioned a few things, you know, take courageous conversations beyond diversity. Um, you can find how to sign up through for that through Leadership Austin, which is a great organization. Um, I just shared a resource in the chat, which is the Startup Diversity and Inclusion Pledge that Stephen Strauss um, initiated. Stephen was actually the one that introduced me to Courageous Conversations. And like I said, putting our entire company through it, all of my executive team has been through it so far and we're cascading it through the entire company and making that a part because then we all have a shared understanding. We all have a shared education. We've all put ourselves in that space. And when you're in that space, again, education is liberating. The truth is liberating and motivates you to change. The other thing, it, you know, Will, is you're going to be talking with my partner on this, um, Lisa Novak, I think in two weeks, right? You and Lisa two weeks. are yes. this in another event. And a CEO needs a partner. I mean, you know, I can, I can do a lot. Of, of course, um, and I've got a big megaphone and I try to use that megaphone wisely. I speak from the heart, I, I speak the truth, um, and I'm not afraid to speak the truth, but I need a partner and my partner is our head of HR. And I need that partner because I'm pulled in a million directions, but her primary mandate is recruiting. I mean, of course, she's got other HR tasks too, but we're hiring a lot of people right now. One of the really neat stats is um, the last six people, or the last seven people we've hired, six of them are female. You know, we've had a big focus on that. A lot of people of color. Um, and, you know, we've really been moving the needle. Like our company is much more diverse as a result of her coming on board because she can spend more time showing up at the events and being, you know, I mean, she's, she's a wholehearted 100% um, believer in diversity and inclusion. I made sure of that prior to hiring her, um, but she's got the bandwidth, you know, to, to show up and be a partner to me on that. Um, but it has to be explicit. It has to be a focus and you have to believe that it's going to make your company better. Like you have to really believe that. And you can't think that you're checking a box because that's not gonna help anybody, including the people you're hiring. If you're hiring someone because you think you're checking a box, how insulting is that to that person? Or if you're investing in someone because you're checking a box, how insulting is that? That's like dehumanizing. That's like saying, well, I'm just checking a box, you know, like. That doesn't make any sense. You, you have to believe, no, I am hiring the best and they're female. I am hiring the best and they're African-American. I am hiring the best and they're Latino, you know? And, and, and this will make us better um, because we'll be more like America, because we'll live up to the original ideas, because we'll have more fun together, et cetera. I mean, you have to believe that and you have to feel that and then if you feel that and you believe that you will become that and your company will become that and that will create the ripple effects once your company becomes more and more successful. I've seen it through Bizarre Voice. I've seen it through Core Metrics. Those ripple effects are very real. I wish that I had had the education at Bizarre Voice. I mean, one of the big failings there is that we had 850 people and I think, um, you know, five to 10 were African-American out of 850, you know, and that's, that's a failure. That is a failure because that didn't unlock some of the ripple effects that it could have had we made 
a lot more people of color wealthy and they go off and start their own companies and you know etc and so you have to explicitly focus on it and and i I've, I've been complicit here i've been complicit because i was uneducated i was blind to it i wasn't blind to racism i was just blind to how systemic it was because i was uneducated so you have to you have to get educated that you have to put yourself in those spaces of of being that way and know that it'll take you and society to a better place. And again, I absolutely agree with Mayor Adler. If everybody took courageous conversations in Austin, if it was mandated that everybody in Austin pay for it, I would gladly pay for it through taxes, et cetera, um, then it would make Austin a much better place. It just would. Yeah. Brandon, uh, bring us home. Um, give, us, yeah. give us the secret sauce, give us the keys. Um, Give us what you guys are. Give us what you guys are doing to to help people in and become more equitable. That 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 strategy that unlocks the championship. Yeah. So I so for us, um, Marx and myself, not only in how we became friends, but how we run this business. Um, I like to think of it as as three things. Right. The first thing is conscience. Like we should see things that bother us it should prick our conscience. We should see George Floyd in the street. We should see the lack of representation. We should be affirmatively bothered by these things. Um, you know, it cites something we bandied about, about people not having conversations with each other, that the stats came out in the wake of George Floyd when they were starting to do the reporting that 75% of white people do not have what they consider to, to be a close black friend, right? So this, this statistic, should prick our conscience. We should make a more affirmative step to, to making sure that our groups and, and who we see ourselves in is reflective of what America is. I think the second thing is, is we got we to challenge people, right? So it's complicity. It's the fact that we're all complicit with, you know, from, we, we talk about politics, right? From anything that's happening at the federal level to anything that's happening in the city of Austin to anything that we see in what is happening because there are things that are being done in our name. Um, they say, oh, well, this is what the American people want. This is who Austinites are, whatever it may be. I, I think we have to understand that these systems of power are constructed and they can be reformed and or torn down. Um, but that's not going to happen if we don't have a deep understanding of our own complicity. And the third thing is towards the affirmative steps, I think of the fact that there was a greater share of black owned businesses in 1963 than there is now. I think of the fact that uh, schools are more segregated now than they were at the time of Brown v. Board of Education. What are the things that we need to do to to be affirmative in what's <laughs> to be affirmative in rectifying racial change? And so for me, I I think look, no matter who you say you are, uh, the two things that are going to be most reflective of you are your time and your dollar. Right? Mm. How you spend your time and your dollar, or who you are, mm. your time. Are you spending time? with people who do not look like you? Are you spending time advocating on behalf of the causes that you actually purport to care about? Or is the limit on time a black square on Instagram or story? Not spending a weekend, donate, not donate, and then on the money side, are you actually donating? Are you even better than donating? You know, patronizing black businesses, finding black suppliers um, and, and stuff like that. So, I, I mean, I will put ourselves out there right now, TXB, is a pretty small team. We are four people right now. We have not yet hired a woman. So we realize that we have the, so it pricked our conscience. It's something that Marcus and I talk about every week. We've made the affirmative step that the next person we every hire day. is going to be. Every day, every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. At least, yeah, we talk about it often. And then we say, well, here's what we're going to do. The next person we're going to hire is a woman. And then we're going to, we're going to encourage that woman to hire another woman to work with them. Right? And then in that, for us, is how we do it, like calling out the truth, recognizing that we're complicit, and then taking steps publicly or privately. And honestly, the harder steps are privately than publicly. And then I wanna say, I'll say this real quick so you can wrap up. And I think as it relates to kind of the venture funds and the private equity funds, because that's the space that we play in, I think it takes people like Brett, you know, LPs of said funds to say, hey, look, you know, you want my money, you better, you guys better start doing some more about this. Because when you're saying bull crap, like you said on that panel last week, I don't want my money going towards that. Because that's when people start to change 
when their mo- when money starts getting funny, that's when people really change and become diverse, you know, advocates overnight. And so why did the Mississippi state of Mississippi change its flag? Exactly. Because the SEC said we're not going to have anything here. It came down to the dollar. Always exactly. does. Even now when we're talking about diversity, we need to sell more people more things. Now all of a sudden we care about diversity, right? Exactly. Guys, I um, this is a conversation that I am super thankful for all parties who have been involved. Everybody who was able to take time out of their uh, no very busy schedules. There's some very um, um, some very busy people on this call. I appreciate it. To my panelists, thank you guys so much. Um, I know that uh, all of you are on LinkedIn. There's some people here I know who would probably want to connect with you. Um, please reach out to these guys on LinkedIn. They've got some. They've got incredible futures and are doing some amazing things. And um, Brett, thank you. Marcus, Brandon, you guys have been absolutely stellar today. Um, I would like to. I would like to thank um, my friends over at Notley Tide for uh, working with me to put together this uh, event. Um, this is the third in our in our uh, four event series. Walking, um, walking with companies so that they can create the structures to really make the change. Um, here are some companies that have worked with Notley Tide. Notley Tide is an extension of Notley Ventures that is that is committed to um, that is committed to diversity training, inclusive hiring, volunteer opportunities, and and also bridging that gap that is is so wide between between races um, and and um and diversity so uh here's some noteworthy companies that are already working working with notley tide um i will follow up with everybody who is on this call that i have the email for i'll send you information and if you're at your organization and you need someone and you need people to to be a sounding board for walking forward into a more equitable environment uh, let me know i can make those connections um, I'd love to be an advocate for you um, in having these kinds of conversations. Brett also put um, put some resources in the um, in the chat box. Um, thank you guys so much, everybody who was who is who is involved today. Um, if you would like to get a hold of me, uh, my email is here. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, on Instagram, um, see what I'm doing all the time. I'd love to, to set up a Zoom call if you want to, to go a little bit deeper into these conversations. Um, reach, reach out. Um, I am available um, and, I, and I, enjoy, I enjoy these conversations. This is something I'm growing and learning and, uh, and excited about. In two weeks, in two weeks, uh, it's I am, I am, I am, here we go, let's stop sharing. In two weeks, we're, we're going to have the fourth event in, um, in this series. I will be welcoming Lisa Novak, who works with Brett over at Data World, um, uh, Suni Lobo, who is the chief, uh, chief people officer at Navis, and then also... Also, uh, just in, Kathy Terry, um, who is the CEO of Inlu and co-founder of P. Terry's, will be, will be involved. I'm super excited about this. This is an all-female um, is, is all uh, panel. Up until now, it's, it's all been male, and I'm excited that we're going to bring it home. The, the topic will be advocacy being, and being work work uh workplace um advocates on the next level these this group of people have have the um have have the years and also the um excitement to really make a change and are and are at the highest levels of business and are actually implementing strategies that are that are making things uh, very special. Excited to talk to Kathy, Suni, and, and, and Lisa in two weeks. That's August 26. If I don't have your information, um, if I don't have your information, if you got a hold of this Zoom call and I don't have your email, 
if you would like to be connected to that and get more information also for me to follow up with, please drop your email in the, in the chat and I will, I will, I will chat with you. Um, panelists, thank you so much, you guys. I really again, appreciate well. it. Um, Thanks, Brad, well. Brad, I know hey, you've, got, Brad. you've got a couple of things you got to get to. Um, I'm, off, I'm off to my leadership team meeting for the quarter. Right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate everybody it. Everybody have a good one.